Hi, Sports to Paul here. We're at Engineering Disaster Ford Week. This was a huge problem at Ford back in 1980 when I worked for them. Uh, the escort car cam belt, the camshaft belt. They were breaking left and right, right before production. It was a huge disaster. Here's a, let's see if you can see this engine here. This happens to be a Kia engine. I found it on the internet, but it's the same problem. The Escort was the first interfering engine, which means if the camshaft loses its thing, and you got a pretty good odd that at least one valve will be all the way down, the piston comes up, it's interfering, it will hit that valve. It'll bend the valve for sure, often break in the heads. Ask any cylinder head shop how many 1980 Escort heads they got laying around, because it, it wasn't worth, um, I'm told by my buddies, wasn't worth fixing, the, the impact was bad enough, it would warp them a little bit. You didn't know if the head gasket would blow, even if you decked it. So they preferred putting new, head, new heads on the, uh, on the escorts. Now, the problem was because of standing waves in this rubber belt, right? I'm a chain guy, I like roller chains, but they used a rubber belt and the standing waves got excited, not when they put them in the dyno, you know, bolted down hard, the engines bolted hard, when the engines went into the mechanical prototypes, the MPs, which are like rabbits that they cut up and welded to make the right hard points, the right form, fit. Then the, the escort motor is on rubber motor mounts and it, it flops around a little. And those, that flopping, because a car will go from 500 RPM to 5,000, lots of octaves, right? You're sure to hit a resonance. That rattled the engine, that rattled the cam belt, that put a standing wave in the cam belt, exceeded its load, snap, right? Boom. Now here's the sad thing, okay? I was all into cars, I was an auto engineer, so Ward's Auto World magazine, uh, Automotive News, Automotive Industry, all these magazines had bingo cards in the back, we used to call it, where you could check and advertisement would have Bingo 67 and Gates Rubber would send you their design guide because they were pushing this. And I think Gates Rubber, by the way, I was in the truck group, so this is all hearsay, you know, but I'm pretty sure it's mostly true. So. The Gates book, you know, I got it and I looked through it and after this happened, I went and looked and it's like, there were like four or five general design you know, principles, how wide to make it for how much load. But the big one that Ford screwed up was the relationship between static load, in other words, just sitting there and not running, not doing anything, and dynamic load, where it's actually running the camshaft. Then on top of that, the standing wave from the resonance that the motor was shaking in the, in the rubber motor mounts put, in, put in instantaneous higher loads and snapped those belts. So, you know, I, I assume Gates told Ford, I think it was a Gates belt, they, they told the Ford engineers how to do things, and I have to believe the Ford engineers, oh, we're Ford, we know better, right? Gates knew better, right? They should have listened and done whatever it took to do, okay? So let's get into it a little bit more and talk about the, the problems driving a camshaft. Okay, here's that Kia engine blown up because it's the most dramatic one I could find. I'm sure there's plenty of Ford Escort engines or heads, actually, that took the brunt of it. The first thing Ford did, and this is kind of shameful, I think, we went to the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and we said, hey, this isn't pollution related with a 50,000 federally mandated warranty, right? This is a 12,000 warranty because they didn't really care if they broke as long as they didn't have to pay for it, right? This is the finance whiz kid, McNamara problems at Ford back in the 80s. It's a different company today. And the EPA came back and said, no, we're sorry. That's definitely a pollution control item and it's definitely gonna be a 50,000 mile warranty thing. Now Ford's in a panic. They authorized 24 hour overtime. That's how we knew about it in the truck group. Any engineer could go over there and help, and I wish I'd have gone over because with my electronics background, the idea of a resonance that when it's on rubber motor mounts, it snaps belt, but when it's bolted down hard, that just seemed obvious to me what was going on. So let's go back and look at the ways Ford of America and Ford of Europe handle this. Okay, once again, this is hearsay because I'm in the truck group just here in this and in the grapevine, supposedly, this is, a, this is a world car. The Ford Escort was the first world car and it was a huge program and all kinds of, you know, glamour associated with it. So it was being sold in Germany, right? So Ford of Europe had it. Now, I am told what the Germans did when they saw that it was breaking cam belts six months before, they said, how much to widen the timing cover and widen the belt by five, 10 millimeters. And for the design group at Ford, said, oh my God, that'll, you know, the, everything changes, all these mounts change. And Ford of Europe just said, do it. 
And so I'm told that you can go look at a European Ford Escort 1980 engine, and it's a little bit different. Not sure if that's true. Now, in America, the overtime, the, you know, in, in a way, it's more admirable. Let's understand what's going wrong, right? So that's when they started looking into it, and finally they figured out, the mechanical engineers figured out something that to an electrical engineer is kind of obvious. So you've got a resonance problem, okay? So it was a, a radically different approach. I noticed in 1980, in researching this article, in 1985, the escort engine isn't an interfering engine anymore, right? Now, cam belts are nice because they're quiet. Like, you know, Harley would love cam belts because they make so much noise just in the gears and the motor and stuff. So cam belts have that. They're, I think, maybe even a little more efficient than a chain drive. But I don't want one. Look at this picture. This is my friend's Lori's Honda. Okay, big chunk taken out of it, still working, didn't lose it. And I'm not sure if a Honda Accord is an interfering engine or not. But Lori is a musician and she had the ear. She could hear when this little, there, there was a piece missing, right? That was flapping as it went around, hitting the top of the tin cover. And she said, that's funny. And not only that, she was smart enough to know, turn the car off, have it towed. So her husband and I got into it. It's like, oh my God, look at this. So I'm not a belt guy, right? To this day, I'd rather have an engine that has a timing chain. Gears are noisy, right? Gears are whiny. Those hot rodders put gear conversions on and they're like, oh my God, it sounds like a blender. But give me a cam belt soaked in oil, or I'm sorry, a cam chain soaked in oil. I'll take that over a belt any day, all right? With the moniker Sportster Paul, I got Sportsters. I sold a new one in 96, but that had a belt, a belt drive in the back. They've tried, no, nobody's pulled off successfully, even after market, a cam belt on the primary side where the clutch and the engine sprocket goes. It's kind of a hard environment there. But going back, even with more torque on it, and of course the belts have improved, they're even better. The Gates belts now, they have Aramid and all these cool, cool uh, uh, fabrics or, or uh, backbones to them. And so a sports to rear wheel is about the absolute worst. You can't really have static tension because when the, the seat goes down, right? When, when you hit a bump and the swing arm comes up, you look at the relationship, it, it, it's not centered, right? The swing arm isn't the same point, pivot point as, as, as the front cog for the belt. So it tightens. So the trick uh, Duncan Keller at Yankee Ingenuity showed me, what he does is he puts a rag and wraps the rag around and then feels just to make sure that when he unwraps it and the rag's gone, better looser than tight. Because when they're tight, you break all the bearings. You know, you'll, you'll scuff the bearings and that'll all seize up and be a serious safety problem. Uh, you'll see, here's a picture on the chain guard or belt guard, I guess, of, of a later model Sportster with a belt. They got these little marks and they tell you, you know, push up and it does get a little stiff and when it goes that far, that's how much tension you're supposed to have on it. They also have a tool. It's got like these hooks that go on the belt out here and a plunger, a spring plunger that pushes up. And that way, by, by hooking it here and pushing it on in the middle, they can figure out the tension. That's what the factory mechanics do, you know, to get the tension right on. So somehow, you know, progress has occurred that in by the late 90s, at least. And get this, the Sportster belt, if I read right, has gone from an inch and a half down to an inch, right? So you make the tires bigger and all kinds of good stuff happens. So it's possible, but it wasn't possible at Ford. Now, I should have mentioned the way Ford fixed it, Ford of America, change the, change the tensioner spring to, to add more static tension, change the tensioning stuff. And by the way, you can't keep a spring a spring-loaded tensioner, because as these resonances happen, the, the spring, will, it just adds a resonance. So the procedure on almost every cam belt is like, you let the spring do its thing, push, and then bolt it down hard, and that establishes the static tension. So big fun, you know, sports just pulled it off, but not for it in 1980. Now, just like that Sportster has the wheel going up and down, making the belt tight and, tight and slack, a camshaft is a horrible load. It's what I call a lumpy load because there's these cam lobes. And so it, it takes all kinds of pressure as you push down a lifter and the cam lobe is pushing down the lifter. Then you get on the, the, the top of the lobe and it's kind of not much. 
Then you get on the back side of that lobe and it actually goes the other way. The cam actually snaps forward. So it just loves to put these standing waves in a belt. And of course, the fewer cylinders, the bigger the problem. An eight cylinder has got, you know, you might, well, if it has multiple valves, it often just has, you know, a pair of lifters. So it'll have 16 lifters, 16 lobes on, a, on an old fashioned, like a push rod style. So double overhead cam, now it's even worse, right? You got fewer lifters, so it's even lumpier, fewer cam lobes on that double shaft. So that's even a worse load, right? Bump, bump, bump. So those, that lumpy load is what's putting in this horrible, horrible standing wave, right? Now here's a picture of, I think, let me look, it's a KTM motorcycle. See how smart these people are? They put a water pump on the end of the camshaft. They've got a huge problem. They got one cylinder, right? And I believe it's just one cam. So now, you know, it, it's better than if I had double overhead cams, but still, you know, very few lobes, really lumpy. You know, if you went to turn that, it would, then all of a sudden it would snap forward. So the, the secret there is you put a damped load and a water pump is a beautiful damp load because it got little fins in water. And if you try to turn it fast, it resists more. And, and so all that jittery, hoppy, nasty stuff is made much better because you're driving water pump. An oil pump would also you know, be a little bit better, but water pump is ideal, right? So there's ways around this, okay? Now, Duckworth designed an engine. My friend Dave Mathers, rest in peace. He told me about this, uh, I think Keith Duckworth, is that his name? Yeah. He designed this cam drive for Cosworth and he put all kinds of compliance in it, you know, trying to help with these torsional issues. And here's a picture of that thing. To me, that's not the solution. You know, putting compliance in the system, like these phasers that advance and retard camshafts and brand new, you know, modern cars, 2020 cars, 2022, they, they're stiff, right? They'll change the phase of the cam relative to the, to the teeth so they can advance the timing or retard the timing, but they're stiff, right? They're, they're not like some sloppy springy thing. And that's the whole secret, why some of them are hydraulic, right? They can be relatively stiff, so it doesn't make all these resonances work. So, for me, you know, the, the, the kind of torsional vibrations, this uh, Duckworth system, I'd rather not have it. And, and probably why you don't see it in a production car with, you know, long-term reliability problems. All right, just to hammer this in, right? A lumpy load is one thing, right? Lump, lump, and it overruns, and it, you know, does all this. But then on top of that, you've got the resonance problem. This thing like an engine goes from 500 to 5,000 RPM, lots of octaves, right? So. Uh, it's a decade, actually, right? 500 to 5,000, that's times 10. So you're guaranteed to hit every conceivable rev resonance on every conceivable system inside that engine. So uh, a friend, Dave, Dave, had this Go Power, same guy that told me about the, the Duckworth. Dave told me he used to work for Go Power, which makes dynamometers, right? And he talked a story about how his buddy Hans, the mechanical engineer, designed this gorgeous shaft coupling and when the dyno manufacturer got hold of it, they took that off and put a two inch rod. And then that started failing because it would hit resonances. It would get hot, take a fatigue limit and snap. So that shows you how resonances can brutally affect the drive system. This happens to be a metal drive, but it's, it's the kind of load, right? It, that's the first thing uh, Browning or anybody will ask you, what kind of load is it? A ball crusher, really intermittent, a water pump, nice and smooth. Uh, this is another story from my buddy Andy Masto, had an engine repair shop and engineering VP and a, a genius in general. He worked on, uh, it might've been Formula Ford or Formula V cars and they were snapping uh, well, well, they were snapping half shafts, you know, back in, in the axle, the two rear axles. After a while, they'd snap. I say, okay, we'll put a harder axle, right? It's got to be stronger. Let's use a high strength carbon steel. Those snapped even quicker. It was a similar kind of thing. What they ended up doing when they finally figured out, they put like a, not a scribe, because that would be bad, but like a, a pencil or a, a magic marker line on the, on the half shafts, brand new. Then they noticed when they twisted like 90 degrees or 40 degrees, they had a number. Okay, take those out, throw them away, put a new pair in. 
And this, once again, is hitting resonances that are kind of elastically. You're not in the plastic deformation. So this isn't a fatigue failure. This is just stacking up and stacking up and putting more elastic deformation into the axle shaft until finally, goodbye axle shaft. So that's a, a couple little shaft drive tips to go with this cam belt. So the lesson here, whether you're driving a shaft or gears or chains or belts, read all the stuff from the manufacturer, read all the literature you can. You have to test it. Don't think, you know, oh, it'll definitely work. You're going to have to test it over regimes, hot and cold, all these other problems, and make sure that you know the, the, the drive, the load, you've characterized all that, the worst case loads, all of this business. It's not as easy as it sounds, right? If you do that, then maybe unlike Ford billion dollar multinational company, you won't have a gigantic disaster six months before high volume production, all right? Okay, Sports to Paul, catch you next time. Thanks for watching. Tune in again. <laughs>